So welcome through to the first full lesson run through of lesson one of the ecology unit from your GCSE course. So if you have got the booklet available or print out of the lesson in front of you, you should have the first sheet on lesson one, which is communities, interdependence and competition. So if you are following through this video, the first thing that you should do is take a few minutes, pause the video and have a look at the knowledge check questions on the next two pages um, and see how many of them you can answer. So from question one to question 10, based on your own knowledge of ecology, previous content knowledge that you might have picked up and um, any other additional research that you want to do. Once you've done that, we will go through the answers. So pause the video now and have a go at these knowledge check questions. Right, you should have now unpaused the video. So if we just reveal the answers for you. So the first thing we've got here, where it says name seven characteristics of all living things. You might have come across this anagram before, Mrs. Gren or Mrs. Nurg, that give you the seven things that live all living things do. They move, they reproduce, they have sensitivity, they are aware of their surroundings and they can sense their surroundings and have um, pain receptors and things like that. They grow, they respire, they excrete, so they take dumps, they... Um, release waste from their body and nutrition they obviously need to eat nutrients to survive an organism is a living structure capable of growth and reproduction ecology is the study of relationships between organisms and their physical surroundings and when you've looked at photosynthesis before this might ring about name the products of photosynthesis the two things that are produced as a result of photosynthesis are glucose and oxygen so obviously mark the questions that you've done and if you've not got any of them right or got things wrong pause the video and make sure you write in the correct definitions and make any corrections so if you've done that and you've paused the video unpause it and we will look at the next set So, five, suggest what hap when photosynthesis happens. Photosynthesis happens during daylight hours. Suggest when plants respire. Plants respire all hours of the day and night. A habitat is an area in which specific organisms live. A population is the total number of species living in a geographical area. So the total number of a species, that should say. So if we were talking about, I don't know, kangaroos, it would be the total number of kangaroos living in a specific area. Right. Excuse my pen. If we carry on. And then a couple of questions just jog your memory from previous content. What type of reaction releases energy into the surroundings? That's exothermic. And what type of waves oscillate perpendicular to the di their direction of travel? They are transverse waves. Right, so the point of this lesson is to make sure that you can understand what an ecosystem is and how it's organised, and explain that organisms compete with each other for resources and state what these resources are. So... Let's go through the paragraph together. And as you can see, there are lots of notes and annotations around the edge that I've added in that if at any point during this video, you want to make sure you've got them down in your own notes, just pause the video and make sure you make a note of these annotations in the context of what I'm talking about. So let's go through the paragraph together. Ecosystems describe the interactions of all the living and non-living parts of the environment. So an ecosystem, as we said, is the living parts and their geophysical environment, the terrain, the trees, the rivers, everything that is not necessarily living but still in that environment. And they are a single interactive entity. And this term was first coined by a um, British biologist in the 1930s called Arthur Tansley. Now, we want to sort of think about organisms within these ecosystems. Organisms rely on things from their environment along with other organisms in order to survive and reproduce. So number one biological goal of every single organism that exists is they want to survive in order to reproduce and produce more of their species. Now, organisms rely on things from their environment. So, for example, 
You have a species that is a predator. They rely on the prey that they eat for food. Plants rely on carbon dioxide and water that they get from the environment to take in to photosynthesize. And these are important things to consider. So if you think about plants, plants compete for resources such as light, space, minerals, and water. These are things that are all basically needed for plants to photosynthesize and to be able to reproduce effectively. Whereas animals compete for food, water, space, mates. So we're not talking about best buddies, we're talking about reproductive mates or the animals that they want to enjoy themselves with to make new organisms of their species and territory. So when we're talking about this idea of competing, they're fighting for resources. They want those resources in order to be able to survive. Now, as you can sort of just zoom in here, there are two types of competition that it's worth bearing in mind, interspecific and intraspecific. If you have interspecific competition, that is organisms of different species competing for resources within their geophysical environment in order to survive. Intraspecific is when organisms of the same species are competing for resources to be able to survive. So if you're thinking about different packs of lions trying to compete to eat um, antelope or wildebeest or something like that, those lions are competing for the same food source. That is intraspecific, whereas if it was a lion and um, a pack of cheetahs, they are different species. So they would be competing for the same resource. So it's worth bearing that difference in mind. Now, a community is a group of living organisms that coexist within Within a community, each species depends on others for shelter, pollination, food, and seed dispersal. Now, this is known as interdependence. So, interdependence is when species depend on each other for resources for survival. And if you have a change in one species, that's going to affect a change, that's going to change and affect the other species in terms of their ability to survive. Now, what is a species? A species is defined as a group of organisms that can interbreed and produce fertile offspring. Now, what do we mean by something that is fertile offspring? We mean the offsprings themselves can reproduce. So, for example, if you think about um, if you think about um, a horse and a donkey, a horse and a donkey can reproduce, but they produce a mule. Now, a mule is infertile; it cannot produce offspring itself. So that shows you that the horse and the donkey are still separate species, whereas a horse and a horse reproduce together, produce a foal, a baby horse, that is a fertile offspring that can grow up and then have its own offspring. So interdependence within, e within an ecosystem means that any major change to that ecosystem can have far-reaching effects. In some ecosystems, all the species and environmental factors are in balance, so the population size remains fairly constant. These are stable communities, and you get examples of those like tropical rainforests and ancient woodlands. Now, we'll go back to this guy Tansley, Arthur Tansley, British biologist. He called this idea of, species, of ecosystems being in balance the great universal law of equilibrium. And what his point was, was that he was the first guy to sort of coin onto the idea that um, there are cycles within an ecosystem that contain feedback loops that correct fluctuations from a state of equilibrium. Now, what that means is that ecosystems go through cycles in terms of their environment and the state of their environment. So ecosystems can have things like floods, droughts, earthquakes, and then if you factor in um, human activity, you can have increases in pollution, deforestation. And what that's basically causes within the ecosystem is populations to fluctuate might go up might go down depending on the factor but if the community is relatively stable the population over time will return to kind of middle constant level so We've got a load of information there. If needs be, pause the video, go through your notes, add some annotations, add some of the things that I've been talking about. And once you've done that, unpause the video and have a look for me now at this first little activity down here. Now, 
What I'd like you to do, and I'm going to give you the time to do this yourself, is again, pause the video and spend some time watching these two YouTube clips. You might need to type them in yourself into your browser, but or if you're using a PDF, you can click on um, these straight through. But once you've watched these two, can you then have a go at defining as many of the terms as you can on the next page? So, pause the video, watch those two videos for me, please. And once you've done that, then go on to the next page and have a go at defining these terms. So, pause the video and have a go. Right, you should have unpaused the video now, and so let's go through the terms. Hopefully you've got some definitions down, and we can just see what you got and what we need to correct. So, let's just remove our box here. Goodbye box. Right, an ecosystem. Kind of defined it already, but it's an interaction of a community of living organisms with the non-living parts of their environment. A producer is an organism that generates its own food and energy. A consumer is an organism that eats other organisms for energy. Get primary, secondary, tertiary consumers. A decomposer is an organism that breaks down organic materials, such as the remains of dead organisms, and absorbs them into the environment. A community is a group of two or more populations of different species living in one area. And then finally, a population is the total number of organisms of the same species that live in one specific area. Right, what I'd like you to do now is, again, I'm going to ask you to pause the video and have a go at this question here. Explain the interdependence that occurs between bees and crops. So, firstly, pause the video, use your notes, use research, use anything, resources you want to look at, and have a go and see if you can come up with four points. Once you've done that, unpause the video and we'll go through the answer. If you're a bit stuck, just watch on and we'll try and break down this question and go through it together. So, pause the video and then have a go. Right, should have unpaused the video now. So, if we have a little look at the question. So, the question says, explain... Let's just explain the interdependence that occurs between bees and crops. So if we're thinking about our command word, explain is the what happens. What happens in terms of interdependence? Now, interdependence, we've already talked about, is the reliance of different species on each other for survival. So let's think about our first point. Bees. They depend on cereal crop flowers the nectar which is a food source so if you took away the crops you take away the nectar the bees wouldn't have a food source now how do the cereal plants reproduce they need to have the bees pollinate them And then, what else is needed? So, they also are needed to produce new seeds and reproduce to produce more cereal plants. So, without the bees... Cereal plants wouldn't be pollinated, therefore they wouldn't reproduce. And then, the reproduction is important because they're going to feed the next generation of bees. So if you took one away, the other wouldn't survive for these different reasons. It's good. If you've had a go at that, brilliant. If you've just sort of had a watch of that, hopefully that makes a bit more sense to you now. 
So if we go on to the next page, so there's some questions for you to consider. So at this point, again, pause the video, have a look at the questions and see if you can answer them, them yourself and using any resources you've got. Once you have done that, then unpause the video and we'll go through the answers. Right, you should have unpaused the video. So if we just get rid of our table and it shows you some answers. So name the factors that make up an ecosystem. They're the living organisms and non-living organisms, the non-living parts. Give two examples of each. So trees are a living organism, rainwater is non-living but they interact within an ecosystem explain why there are no cacti in the ocean because they can't get the resources that they need for survival explain why plants are called producers because they produce their own food via photosynthesis from the sun define a balanced ecosystem a balanced ecosystem is where species and environmental factors are in balance and so the population numbers remain relatively stable Describe the impact of an imbalanced ecosystem. This causes changes in species population numbers, which can have a knock-on effect to other species due to interdependence. Give examples of factors that can disrupt an ecosystem. So if you introduce new predators or pathogens, or if there's great competition between species, that's going to have a greater impact on population numbers. And then describe how an ecosystem recovers. So if it's a stable ecosystem, if you've got to have a fluctuation, it needs time to readjust to a stable, balanced level. Right, if we go on, have a little think about the effects of interdependence. So as our paragraph says, ecosystems are in a very fine state of equilibrium. Equilibrium is a posh word for balance. Although they fluctuate, the population size of most species remains constant over time. However, a new species entering an ecosystem would often compete with native species for resources. If a species is removed, then it could have a significant impact on the rest of the ecosystem. Remember, that's due to interdependence. So take away one species, other species that rely on it might then be impacted in terms of their numbers because it's not there anymore. And then change in the environmental conditions can cause a population increase or decrease of a species. So environmental events such as a flood, a drought, anything like that can have impacts on species numbers. In the introduction of new species into an ecosystem, there's an example where grey squirrels were introduced into the UK and um, basically outcompeted red squirrels so that red squirrel numbers in the UK have dropped drastically. And we will look at more of that in later lessons. So there's another little activity I want you to have a look at. And this gives you a food web. So this is a food web. So it shows you feeding relationships of these different organisms in this ecosystem. So it's telling you who eats who. So wherever you've got an arrow, it shows the transfer of energy between organisms. So stickleback eat stonefly larvae, and the energy from the stonefly larvae is transferred to the stickleback. And the same for all of those different arrows. So have a look at that food web. Then there are some questions on the next page to have to think about how they are interlinked. If population of one disappears, how is that going to impact the population of another? So pause the video, have a look at the following questions, and then have a go for me, please. Right, you should have unpaused the video and had a go at those questions, so let's go through the answers. Let's get rid of our blue box. Right, suggest what would happen to the stonefly population if the pollution levels of the water increased. Now, it would decrease due to increased toxicity as a result of the pollution that they then absorb from the water. Suggest the effect of this pollution on levels of algae. The levels of algae would also decrease. Suggest the effect of this pollution on the population 
of the water spider. They would decrease due to there being a decrease in stonefly larvae because they eat the stonefly larvae. So, and it's its main food source. So if the stonefly larvae have gone, they haven't got enough food to eat, so therefore their population would decrease as well. Suggest the eventual effect on the pike population. The pike population would decrease due to the stickleback decreasing which would be caused by decreasing the stonefly larvae population. Because if you look back at the food web, the pike eat the stickleback, the stickleback eat the stonefly larvae. The stickleback don't eat anyone else. So if the stonefly larvae are gone, then the stickleback don't have enough food, so the stickleback numbers decrease. And if the pike don't have as much stickleback, they've only got frog to eat, and they'll be less frog to frog to go around so more pike are more likely to die off right let's go through the ideas in relation to competition so let's go through the paragraph competition with any within any any ecosystem there are a limited amount of resources so organisms have to compete with each other so remember inter and intra specific competition either between different species or between the same species competing for resources for survival competition is the interaction between animals or plant species or individual organisms that attempt to gain a share of limited resources needed for survival so that's a posh way of saying it's fight club it's dog eat dog it's do or die it's an organism needs that resource to survive if it doesn't get it it's not likely to survive so if you think about for example plants they need carbon dioxide, they need oxygen for photosynthesis, for survival. There's another term that you might need to be familiar with, and that is invasive competitor. And that is when a new species is introduced to an ecosystem, it competes for the same resources as organisms that are already there. Now, if we go on to the second half of the paragraph, in order to compete more successfully and therefore survive and reproduce, organisms can develop special features over time called adaptations. So adaptations are unique features that an organism has in order to be able to survive. And this allows them to operate in different niches. So if we just bear that in mind, what I'd like you to do, we'll come back to different types of adaptation in a minute, is just flick through to your note page which you'll see student on notes page and I want you to make some notes just like mine to give you an example of different adaptations now these adaptations that we're going to talk to you about are record, recorded by a guy called Robert MacArthur who was a biologist um, in the 1960s of North American warblers now they are cute little birds that look something like that and the key thing is they develop distinctive features and markings so adaptations and i want you to imagine that this is one tree i don't know these don't look particularly like amazing trees but they are trees and you've got one two three four five different types of warblers and they all live in the same tree Cape May warbler lives roughly around the top. The black Bernian warbler lives in the middle and up the top. The black um, throated green warbler lives closer down to the middle of the tree. The bay breasted warbler lives completely in the middle of the tree, not really near the edges. And the yellow rumped warbler lives in the bottom and the middle edges. Now, these warblers are able to sh share the same tree as they inhabit their own niche their own specific area. Now they coexist because they don't overlap and therefore they can avoid competition. So they develop these distinctive features to live in these specific areas of a tree so that they can coexist and don't uh, and avoid competition with each other. So they're more likely to survive. So it might be worth taking a minute, pause the video and you can make a little note of this key biological example of developing adaptations to fit within a specific niche. Right, once you've done that and unpaused the video, skip back to our previous pages on competition. Now, there are 
three specific areas of competition that you need to know about. Uh, not competition, adaptation even. Get the right words. There are three specific types of adaptation. Structural, behavioural and functional. You've got some examples about different adaptations here. You can read those yourself. You can see those yourself. I want to talk to you about these types. Now, a structural adaptation is where an organism has changed its physical features to become adapted to survive within a specific environment. Behavioural is, be is when an organism has changed its behaviour over time to be able to adapt with and survive within an environment. And then functional adaptations are ones where organisms have changed and developed their processes in order to be able to survive within environments. So processes, we're talking about being able to produce things like toxins and poisons or being able to carry out things like photosynthesis. So, Again, just skip through down to, I think, page 14. I've put in a couple of pictures, but you can just take a couple of notes. What I want you to think about is the adaptations of these three different types of animals and organisms. So take a moment, pause the video, make some notes on the adaptations that a polar bear, a camel, and cactus have in order to be able to survive within a specific environment. Once you've done that, we'll unpause the video and go through them. Right. Should have unpaused the video. So if we just go through them. So if we start with the polar bear. Specific adaptation. White fur for camouflage. Nice and easy for hunting prey. Feet with a large surface area. Now, that distributes its weight on the snow so it can walk more easily on the snow. Small ears in order to reduce heat loss, because they've got a smaller surface area, and got thick fur and blubber for insulation. Now, if you think about all of these, these are all structural adaptations. These are physical features that the polar bear has developed. Think about the camel. Now, again, it's got wide feet for a large surface area in order to distribute its weight across the sand so it can walk more easily on the sand. Now, the hump stores fat. Don't get confused about storing water. It stores fat, which is an energy store for when it's got very little food. It's got a tough mouth and tongue. So it can eat cacti and a lot of desert plants. And then also it's got long eyelashes. To stop sand getting into its eyes. And if you think about the cacti. It doesn't have leaves. It has spines. And these reduce the surface area. So therefore less water is lost. And also deters consumers from trying to eat them. Long roots, cacti, where do you find them? You don't find them in a rainforest, you find them in the desert. So they try and reach water that's far underground. And then they have a large fleshy stem. And that is to try and store as much water as possible because water is a very scarce resource. So if you think about these adaptations, they're pretty much all structural adaptations in terms of how the organism, polar bear, camel, cacti, changed over time in order to be able to survive in these specific environments. Now, if we finish with going back to these couple of pages, you've got questions on page 12 and page 13 about competition, about what we've done today. So, pause your videos and spend a good chunk of time using any resources you've got, using um, notes from today's lesson to try and answer these questions then when you've done that, unpause the video and we will go through them and just give you some answers to finish off. Right, you should have unpaused the video, so let's go through these questions to finish. Just get rid of our big blue box. So, plants in a community are often in competition with each other for water and mineral ions. Describe where water and mineral ions come from. The soil. 
plants get rained on, water goes into the soil, plants get the um, water through their roots um, that run into the soil. State two of the factors plants compete for and why. Light and space. So plants need light and space in order to be able to maximise the resources they get for photosynthesis and be able to spread out their seeds so that their seeds have a greater chance of surviving and um, growing and allowing that plant to reproduce. Animals in a community also compete with each other. State three factors animals are in competition for. Three examples might include food, reproductive mates, and territory. Meerkats live in desert areas of southern Africa. They are pack animals who are led by an alpha male and a female. Suggest reasons why younger males will often try to fight the alpha male of the packs. It's an obvious one. So they can have first choice over potential reproductive mates in the pack. And if they can do that, they are more likely to reproduce and survive. As we've said, is every organism's biological instinct. Explain why meerkat packs often split into smaller packs with new packs moving quite a distance from the original. If you've got packs that have spread out, there's going to be less competition for the same resources. If there's less competition, there's more chance of survival. Define a community where each species depends on each other. So that word we're looking for is an interdependent community. Four things species depend on each other for. Food and shelter can be for animals and sometimes plants. And seed dispersal and pollination, if we're talking about the reproduction and survival of plants specifically. Blue tits live in woodland ecosystems. They feed on caterpillars who in turn um, feed on plants. Both live in trees on plants. Explain what would happen to the plants and blue tits if the caterpillars were, would remove. Plant population would probably increase because there's less predation from caterpillars trying to eat them. Whereas the blue tit population would probably decrease as there's less available caterpillars, less food source available for them to eat. And then describe how some species develop to compete more successfully with others over time within their ecosystems. So they've developed adaptations over time through reproducing, through the production of evolution, to make them bigger, faster and stronger and more likely to win the competition for specific resources they need for survival. And then, don't forget, if you haven't got those answers, just make sure you go back to the page and... Pause the video and make sure you've got those down correct. Any questions you've not got right. And then to finish, we just have a little look at our questions here. So we've got the definition of an ecosystem from earlier, where um, you've got living organisms and non-living parts of an environment interacting. Community, whereas two populations of different species live in a specific geographical area. Interdependence, when different species depend on each other for resources for survival. Competition is contest between organisms for resources needed for survival. Resources animals compete for, food, mates and territory. Resources plants compete for, light, space and water. Two examples of stable communities, rainforest and woodland. A species, remember, biologically similar organisms that breed to make fertile offspring. So offspring that can reproduce themselves. Then question nine is just a question from one of your previous units to jog your memory. Where does nuclear radiation originate from? The nucleus of an atom. Hint, hint, nuclear radiation comes from the nucleus. And then this is an example that might be worth, if you have the time, um, just having a look at um, some clips on YouTube about um, Australian cane toads. There's one called um, Invasion of the deadly cane toads um australia with simon reeve which is a bbc clip on um youtube it's worth watching it's just out of interest the cane toad was introduced into australia in the 1930s a way of controlling other pests from attacking the crops suggest what happened to the population of cane toads once the pests had all been eaten now the cane toads didn't die out they adapted to survive off other resources and then grew in vast vast numbers and it's worth looking into that one just as a good example um of adaptation for survival so you've got a vast amount of information here and there's lots and lots of content so make sure you've gone through the video paused on any of the pages where you've not made notes that you want to or not got your head around some of the key facts make sure you've got all those bits down and hopefully that'll give you a really good starting point for what is an ecosystem so well done and i will see you on the next